Welcome to the Inspiration Hour with Luce M. Mack, as we inspire by sharing real people's stories and their exhilarating journeys. We all learn by sharing our gifts and talents through the power of talking with one guest at a time. Get cozy, get your favorite nighttime drink, and let's get ready to be wild with inspiration. Okay, good evening, everyone. And I'm so grateful for joining uh, tonight, the Inspiration Hour with Luz Mack. And we have a wonderful guest. Her name is Nicole. She's a friend. She's a founder and a creative director and also a mama. Like, hello, talk about someone is, that's doing, like killing the game in more than three ways. So uh, just to give you a little bit of insight about Nicole, Nicole is our founder and creative director of Sumato and also Anne-Marie Accessories. She doesn't have one business, she has two. So talk about stepping it up here. Uh, she has a degree in fashion merchandising management from the prestigious Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. She has over 18 years of experience in the fashion industry, including interning at Kenneth Cole, product development at Tommy Hilfiger, merchandising at the Asia Society Museum. And she also owned an online children's boutique, Tyler and Madison. Nicole's focus is on making sure the best quality fabrics are sourced and have all the styles most comfortable for our customers. She wants all girls to look and feel great while dressing age appropriate. Nicole wants the Sumato logo and brand to represent fun and trendy, unique looks, amazing quality with great comfort, and most importantly, empowering and encouraging young girls to know their worth. And actually, I met Nicole. I had the pleasure of meeting her uh, while she was uh, at a children's festival. And that's how I got to know her brand, Samato. But besides that, uh, she started during the pandemic, Anne-Marie Accessory, which is a handmade accessory line that focuses on lightweight, genuine leather, wood, and polymer clay pieces that are stylishly made for girls to rock and enjoy. And also not just little girls, but for mommies too. So without further ado, let's welcome Nicole. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Luce. I'm really excited about this opportunity. So it's been a long time, right? It has, <laughs> a couple of years. <laughs> it has, and, and it's funny because I've had you on my mind and I kept saying, I'm going to reach out to let you know what I've been working on. But as you know, life gets in the way. I Absolutely. have three kids and Same. you know the pandemic. And... <sighs> We've been through a lot in the last almost two years now. So I completely understand. <laughs> we should really be doing this with some wine, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as we reflect back. But the joy was meeting you because at the time, I was just dabbling in creating fashion for the first time. And I was so like enamored with what you were doing with your little girl. If you could tell us a little bit about how you started Samato before we get to Anne Marie Accessories, because that to me, it was so important because that's how I met you. You showed yes. me these really beautifully made custom made leggings. And one of the designs was from your, your little girl's drawing, if I remember correctly. I might be yes. wrong. No, you're I absolutely correct. And I'm glad you remember that, actually. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, Su Sumatu is my baby, will always be my baby. And I started that because my daughter at the time, when I came up with the idea, she was eight. But when I finally launched, she was around 10. And I just, she's a very fiery personality. And I just love how bubbly, fun, and energetic she is. But I noticed that as she started getting older from ages eight to 10, you finding that her peers, they're getting into the older clothing. They want to look older, act older, dress older. And I felt like I've met, even as moms, you know, very insecure women who weren't comfortable with, within their own skin. And I figured, you know, if I can reach out to these girls younger and catch them early on and have them understand how beautiful and amazing they are and they can appreciate themselves for who they are, then they won't grow up with those insecurities. So that's when it started for me. And I really, I had, like you said, mentioned before, I had a, a boutique, Tyler and Madison, but I carried other brands and I always wanted to have my own. So this was and, like the perfect opportunity for me. And I'm so glad you touched on that about like 
how it started by building confidence. You started at home focusing like on your daughter when you noticed that switch. Yes. And with mothers, because the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter at what age us feeling comfortable in our own skin is always kind of like, like it's a always a battle. It's, it's always a struggle, a battle. especially yes. when women change over time. It, it's a different battle. It's like we yes. never outgrow that feeling of awkwardness. I call it like beautifully awkward, you know, like, oh, you're, like, always, <laughs> like you're always feeling like the ugly duckling. And every now and then when you get dressed up, everyone's like, Oh, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's yes, like the- that beautiful, awkward moment. <laughs> No, it's so true. But I, I like that, you know, it, it, it's awkward and you, you getting dressed up as you say that, you know, them not realizing that the beauty is already there, you know, prior to being dressed up. And, and I think that's why I made the pieces that I made. They were unique. They stood out. They were different. And I wanted the girls to be comfortable being in something different that wasn't the norm, you know, so that was key for me. So my daughter, she started drawing little things and I, and I was like, wait, you can draw. And she's like, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and she drew a pig and an owl and I fell in love with it. And I actually turned those two of the styles you're referring to that I turned into prints for the leggings. And I love the color palette for that because they were like, if I remember correctly, it was just something that they could match up, mix and match with different colors. Yes. yes. Because it was like, it's, it, it was like a good neutral. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like I want to say it was like a, it wasn't gray, but it wasn't like light either. It was something so, yeah. you could dress up with lighter colors or darker colors. Yeah, so we had some pop, but you're referring to the pig leggings. They had a gray base with the pink pig on it. It was very uh, like a neutral tone. You can mix and match it. But then we had the bright, fun colors as well. And each leg had a different color to it. So it kind of really stood out. And the way we connected was that you. it was my first time playing with leggings. And I had uh, used, uh, at the time, Printful to create my leggings. And I used an image from my book. And you were kind of like, wow, this is kind of crazy cool, right? Like you're seeing the image to tell a story. Exactly. I I used to make leggings and people, and my whole idea is like, you could wear your story proudly. That was how my idea came about. But uh, a lot of people loved it, especially for fashion, especially for the fashion shows I I did do, which were were two. Um, Yes. (laughs) But don't worry, I only did two too. But I saw that you were able to get into that one that I told you. It was just, it's just a man that I, I love the connection that we made. I'll tell yes. you that. Yes, it was like an instant and I loved it. I loved it too. And I, I feel like when you connected me to, um, I forgot her name from Newark. Josie. Back, Josie yes. for Newark Fashion Show was like, yeah, she represents our people. Because one of the things that I struggled with in the fashion thing, you don't see a lot of girls of color and you don't see Latinas at all. Let me be clear. If you see either white uh, girls that relate to African-American experience, not barely Asians, not very like indigenous girls. Yeah. And it was just like, where are all the girls? <laughs> like, I, I, think, I, think, I think for me, I found them when you're doing the park development stuff, when it came to modeling, that was harder to find. And that's why I was very grateful for what Josie had did with, you know, New Jersey Fashion Week. I was very grateful for that because you got to see, you know, people of your culture wearing your things. So that was key and 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 huge for me, you know, and I had another experience with that with another um fashion show where she kind of brought in a lot of different cultures we had Asian we had you know yes. Caucasian we had African Americans. so it was a nice little accumulation of different cultures it was our community like you can yes. see the clothes yes. and the yes. like the array of our community I think like one of the things I struggled with there was a time where I posted uh pictures from this model who took pictures of the clothing and posted it and I thought like someone had dm me it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I don't know who it was uh, saying like, oh, uh, your your clothing and your message is supposed to be representing like the Latinx experience, but that's not what you're showing me. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Mm. There's like not a lot of Latinas and African-American in these spaces modeling that we know of. They're probably out there, but when you go to these places, you'll be like, where are they? Where are they? You barely see us. 
But I think not just. Allowed. But I think not just that. You have to remember that you're trying to get your message message across to everyone. You're not trying to limit yourself to a certain culture. You want to expose a different culture to the, the, the a Spanish book and have them read it and be like, oh my gosh, this is how it is in this culture. You want to expose other cultures to your culture. So limiting who you're trying to show it to is limiting the whole experience. No, you know? agree, totally agree. But it's interesting like that one feedback and it never left my mind Mm. because of the experience, the limited experience doing a a fashion show, you know, and see what was available. But I, I feel like the newer children's fashion show was like, like, it was just such a humbling experience to me. It was the best. Like I love it. It's still a high. I've done, I've done three fashion shows and that was the best one I've done. Yeah. It's the best. Even uh when I brought one of my models they were like that's amazing like it like everyone left with a good feeling feeling like they were a part of something bigger and I love yes yes so I want to segue into asking you a little bit more about your Anne Marie accessories because as I see you have the fashion brand and then you started your accessory store do you feel like the fashion brand helped you segue into accessories or what was it like? Which one, what was it that inspired you? Is it like we were all singing that song, Bored in the House, and you're like, oh, I'm going to start accessories now. <laughs> no, for me, I'll, I'll be very honest. Um, Suma 2, while it's my baby, it's been my biggest struggle and hurdle. And that comes in with the manufacturing portion of it. I've dealt with several manufacturers, and I feel like they've had control and pigeon held me with my product. And I didn't want that experience again. With Anne Marie Accessories, I make everything. I am in full control. It is made in house, it is handmade, and I have full control of every aspect of that. There's no one telling me I can't do this because you screwed up this or you can't get this fabric. There's no limitation for me. And I love it. Uh, that was, I wanted something that I had full ownership of, and I didn't feel like I was being pigeon held. And I wanted something while I was already catering to the young girl. I wanted to cater to her mom. That's beautiful. Uh, question. Um, since you did mention, <coughs> excuse me, a good thing. Uh, well, it's a, it's a good topic for people to focus. When you're starting a brand, and especially you're doing it small in a smaller scale before you scale up. Yes. There's a lot of upfront costs you're taking in. And one of them is resources. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because to start a fashion brand, it's not like, hey, I'm just going to go to the fabric store. Like you've really made like a a, a product uh, research on the products you're going to cater to. You study a little bit about what's going on and what you want to do, your focus. And after that, how much you're going to be investing in your own brand for the first year yeah I for me I'm fortunate in the sense where my background is in fashion so I knew the steps that need to be taken (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think for me because my background was with larger companies and they already had their resources set up I was just going to those resources when it's your own business you have to now find these resources on your own and that nitty-gritty was the part that almost broke me down and when you're dealing with small quantities small batches a lot of manufacturers don't want to work with you because you're not they they don't want to start a machine to fulfill a 30 pair of legging order you know and that like it almost hurts your heart when they are willing to do it they charge you three times the cost <laughs> and so that has been the torture and the bane of my existence when it comes to sumo too but it's also something that I think at some point in the future I want to really address because it makes it so hard for small companies who are just starting out I can't start out with 500 pieces per style I just cannot so, so it makes it so hard, you know, to even want to continue doing business. So prior to meeting you, I had uh, reached out to like a, a high school friend of mine asking her a question about fashion. And she works, I believe it's in Nautica, like a similar mm-hmm. space to you. Yes, She's not yes. a fashion designer, uh, but sh- she works in fashion. And mm-hmm. we were, I was asking her questions about starting 
my line and, and doing this thing because I was thinking about like wearing your story with pride for kids and, and for moms. So she had said in order to start and this, and, and I'm telling you this from years ago, I might be wrong. So I think it's important to drop real facts, but mm -hmm. to start a brand, you have to have almost a thousand pieces for each thing. Like if you're going to do a t-shirt, it's going to be a black t-shirt, a thousand of those different sizes. Uh, if it's going to be pants, a thousand of those because manufacturers do not want to fill anything that's under $1,000. And that's based on the factories that we use for those companies. You know, when I was at Tommy, that's the kind of companies and factories that we use, you know, and I was thankful to finally find some manufacturers that would do small quantities, but the price that you pay, it's an arm and a leg. Yeah, it is horrible. And I've heard that. <laughs> so this is good to know, because I think people who do want to, you know, dabble in fashion industry should understand if you're going to do this, you have to get very creative with your money. Yes. And yes. the more people <laughs> yes. you have, the better it is for you, especially because there is a small number of us black and brown women representing these spaces and owning these spaces. So yes. that's why the clothes that you see is not always by us. So, uh, also, uh, I'm really so proud that you started Anne Marie Accessories because I think it's even more beautiful knowing that you create everything yourself and it's in house. Yeah. Do your children um, share with that experience with you in your second business? Do they help mommy make the earrings, the, the, the bracelets? <laughs> Are they helping? So, so the name Anne Marie Accessories, my middle name is Anne Marie, okay. and Madison's middle name is also Anne Marie. Oh, that's and great. that's why we came up with that. All the polymer clay pieces she makes. So yes. So I do wood and leather and she does all the polymer clay pieces. And to me, I didn't want to limit it to earrings. So we hopefully this fall we can branch out, but that's the reason behind the name. So whatever pieces, whenever she wants to throw something in there, she has that flexibility to do so because she's also part of that Anne-Marie. That's so great. And she's an entrepreneur, like before she even graduates high school, like she's going to have no, a full she's business. She's had her own business, actually. She's had a dog treat business that she ran for three years. Our local pet resort carried her dog treats. And oh. she only, yeah, she only <laughs> stopped. Yeah, she only stopped it because she's a gymnast and her gym is further away now. So she didn't have the time to juggle it. And it's a perishable item. But she's actually in the work of starting her own business again. Oh, wow. Mom, I'm so proud of you. And I need, I need to take your tips because I have a couple of kids that are interested in starting their own business, but they haven't found their, their calling. They're still like dabbling with it. What I learned and it's, so I'm going to tell you something. What got me to start Suma 2? I'll be very honest. I was watching Shark Tank. I think we've all seen Shark Tank and Damon Dash. Actually, no, it wasn't a Shark Tank. He was doing an interview somewhere. And he looked into the camera and he said, if you're afraid to go for it, don't do it. It's never going to happen. And that was like, oh, okay. That's been my thing. That's been my hiccup. I'm always afraid to make that step. And so I've learned never be afraid to take the step. Madison asked me, am I too young to start a business? No, you're not. You're never too young. Don't be afraid to take the step. You're going to have mistakes. You're going to fail. And if yeah. you're afraid to fail, it's never going to happen. So once I heard that, I failed. This is not my first business. This is now my third and fourth business. And these are the two that happened to just kind of click and stick. But for the kids, let them keep trying. She had her dog treat business. It did well. She chose to stop doing it. You know, she's start, going to start this business. Let them go. Let them try. Let them fail. It's the only way they learn. I agree. I really do. And I always say fail, fail as much as you can now. So when you are building your brand or building your career path, you're like, oh, I already tried that. I remember this yeah. one like that. Like that's how these pieces start connecting. Absolutely. Because if they every, keep every running through has perfection, a yeah, like if they still, if they keep thinking is everything is going to be perfect, it's, it's, it's going to hit harder. Yes. Uh, so who was the person that kept you going and push you forward I feel like it's your daughter Madison but I might be wrong it might be your entire family and just these small moments that clicked for you my husband 
It was my husband. husband has been a huge supporter. When I see the money coming out of the bank and I freak out, he's like, it's okay. We got this. He's always had my back when I'm just like, this is not going to work. He's like, yes, it is. I love it. It's going to be amazing. You just keep going, keep going. I've wanted to quit several times and he's kept pushing me and pushing me. And I'm very, very grateful for him. I feel like your husband and my husband are like the same person because when (laughs) I wrote my first book, my husband was like, great, you did one. I need to see like the 12th one. Like he put some like outrageous number and it took me forever to write like the first book and like to put it together. And I'm like, are you kidding? Like, he's like, you need to pop these like hotcakes. Like, yeah, he, he my, my thinking, hus- like you yes, just my- automate, automate and keep learning. <laughs> my husband's favorite word is okay. It's time to scale. It's to scale. Let's scale. Cause for him it's like, oh, this is a great start now scale to build it more, make it bigger and better. So I got one, I got one machine to cut my, to cut the leather. And he's like, okay, are you ready to scale? You need another machine. So I have two machines now that help me. One is cutting wood, one is cutting leather and I'm putting the pieces together. He's like, is there a better machine so you can scale and do more? I'm just like. (laughs) Well, he sounds like a, like not only a keeper, but someone that you need to be like always the CEO of your business out of yeah yeah. 16 (laughs) years married 22 years together it's just been yeah he's just been my rock (laughs) that's amazing um so do you have multiple gigs to make this your full time and that is a question I ask a lot of my uh business people because I think it's it's really a question that it needs to be asked a lot of people are not very transparent about how hard it is to keep and maintain a business. And I think it's really important to talk about that. I'm going to say that I am very fortunate for the fact that I've been a stay at home mom for 15 years. Um, So I didn't have an outside job that I had to juggle, but being a stay at home mom in itself has been one of the hardest jobs to juggle with three kids. So juggling them and the business has been a struggle, but I am fortunate in that respect. There's been times where I have to scale back on what I'm doing based on how much is coming out of the, you know, family income or how it's affecting us. So that has been definitely a thing that I'm still trying to navigate. You know, it's never, it's never, oh, the money's just there, do as you wish. You know, it's not that easy. Yeah. And I could relate to that because uh, I work full time. Um, uh, My husband works at, there was at one point in time, he had like almost like like two jobs and the kids and we were just like you know it's it's almost like the the game of tag tag team who's it like oh yeah absolutely that's still the the game (laughs) I think one I I remember there was one time I had to fulfill an order of 100 bucks and I was like shit like I don't have it like like that actually hit my head but like always like God is on time and we made it happen and things came through and it was an amazing experience. I did a hundred books and obviously I got to get paid for that yeah. and pay the debt, but it, it's, it's always a struggle. It's for people that are starting. And I, and I like to talk about that transparency about, about having multiple gigs because in one opportunity, I remember I was working with uh, a freelancer who told me, you have no idea. Sometimes I volunteer to cut people's grass just to make things, you know, wow. make ends yeah. meet. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Here you are doing this and you're telling me you're cutting people's grass. But like, it was such a humbling experience to hear someone like, yeah, I work here, I work there and I cut people's grass if I need the extra cash. You yeah, know? no, it, it, it's, it's, it's just the reality of situation. You know, I've worked part-time here and there when I needed to. Um, but it's just, I think when you say you're an entrepreneur, you have your own business, they automatically assume you have money. They don't realize the struggle. They don't realize you're constantly struggling. You know, yeah. you're barely, you know, they, they see people post pictures of my earrings, like, oh my goodness, she's doing so well. Well, yes. <laughs> I hate that. I had so many family members reach out to me in WhatsApp. Like, I hate WhatsApp. It's like the root of all evil. Everyone yes. will ask you for money and they don't yes. understand. You're still trying to understand, like, struggling. make this. 
like my work. my leggings were all over social media so i made it no i did not <laughs> So I know you touched a lot about how did you get started, but how long has it been now when you started Sumato? It, it's been over, I want to say- Sumato was started in 2016. So that is uh, six years. Um, six years. No, sorry, you, five years that I started Sumato and then Emory Accessories was this last year. And then Ty- Tyler and Madison was like way before 2016 when you started? Yeah, that was- I want to say it was 20, no, that was, oh, Madison was born in 06. So that was probably 08. I started Anne Accessories and it was doing really well. And the economy tanked, 08, 09 when the economy tanked. Um, so no, then I started it in 07. Yes. And I had, cause I had a good two years and I was doing really well. I'm talking about, I was doing international sales in Japan. It was doing really well. But it was brands that people already knew. It was upscale children's clothing wear. So it was brands that people already knew, like um, T Collection and, you know, Zoo Lily. So it was more higher end clothing brands. And it did really well. And the economy tanked. People are not going to pay that money for their kids' clothes anymore. (laughs) So that kind of had me close shop. And I stopped doing that for a while. Okay, so I'm just going to repeat something because you touched on something very important. You started Tyler in Madison when your daughter was just born, Madison, like a couple yeah, so of years later. About a year, a year, year and a half, yeah. You had two good years. The economy tank. It didn't stop you. You started Sumatu. No, I had a business before Sumatu. Which was I that? Had... You, you left it. <laughs> you... For a reason, I was a personal stylist. Oh, okay. So, so I did the thing that you see on TV. I went to people's houses. I cleaned out their closets, took them shopping to update their wardrobe. I put my fashion degree to use. <laughs> so, okay. So now you, you, and you made this even more spicier, my love. You went from <laughs> Tyler and Madison, you know, before Sumatu, you were a personal stylist, then you do Sumatu and then Emory accessories. And I guess I want to like harp on this because there is no straight line to success, you guys. No. No. And this is what it is. You discover your passion and you go for it until it works. So yeah. if that's the overall message I'm going to say on this episode, it's that. Like make it work until you're happy with yourself and just enjoying the rise, the highs, the lows, the moments, because your family has really basked in that glory. Like they're, they're mini entrepreneurs, thanks to mama. No, I I definitely agree. I I think you just keep going. You're going to keep trying different things until you find that thing that one, you're passionate and truly enjoying and it's sticking, it's working. People are understanding, they're getting it, what what, what it is and what it's about. And Suma too, as much as it frustrates me sometimes, I'll be honest, because we're talking about entrepreneurship and this is the real thing. I get frustrated. I've wanted to close down Suma too so many times because right now I have no manufacturer for leggings and I'm switching the complete concept of Suma too right now. Uh, and I'm keeps- right there with you because one of the biggest pet peeves I have is that people are like, when are you going to have dolls in Walmart and Target? Like people could just pick up with a buck. And That's I'm not like, how it works. <laughs> and I'm like, I want a new kitchen. I want, <laughs> I need to pay tuition, but you are focusing yeah. on a doll. But that's one of my, if I get emails, those that's like number one email, but I understand where you're getting. No. At. So yeah, for me, I, 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 I need it to be understood. It's not easy. It's a hard journey and every entrepreneur goes through it, whatever their situation is, they're going through it. They have and to go through that process because it absolutely. is, because honestly, I know you don't have to answer for what's going to happen with your legging dilemma, but I'm sure some, I'm sure like the outcome is going to be so much better because once you solve that, obviously another issue is going to happen absolutely because absolutely. they always say once you break <laughs> that level there's like new levels new hurdles and new headaches now I wanted to ask you this um what did you wish you knew before you got into this business that people should know research 
lots and lots of research is involved. If you think you're going to start a business, research for six months before you actually start the business. Know what goes into it. Know whether you need an LLC, whether, whether you need a, a, a resale S-Corp. license, a wholesale license. Know yeah. what you need. Those are big, important things to know. When you come up with a name, research to make sure no one else has that name. But buy the domain of that name immediately. If it's not available, that means you might want to switch to a different name. You want to make sure you have all entity ownership of all entities possible. Um, it's so important because you don't want to get started and get this far along in a business only to find out that you can't continue the way you want or you have customers knowing a name of a business and it's already in existence. Um, that's key when it comes to the fashion industry itself. Manufacture. The name is everything. And, and I agree. Yeah. Because I've, I've heard that from other fashion designers, by the way. Oh, um, yeah. So what advice do you have for someone that's getting into fashion and accessories? Besides the research, what else they should know? Be confident. You're going to have naysayers. You're going to have people that say, this is already here. This is already done. Um, it's not going to work. I would never buy this. I would never pay this much for something. Know the value of what you're doing and have confidence in yourself when you go forward with it. So without Amen. that, you're going to always invest yourself. Amen. You need that confidence. You need to wear it as a badge. Yes. Uh, any resources or places that support Black and Brown entrepreneurs in fashion? I believe there's very limited amount of resources for that, but you might know best since you've been on this game a little bit longer than I have. I think for me, when I went on this journey, I didn't specifically seek out resources that were for Black and Brown entrepreneurs. So I don't know if I can specifically give a certain resource to use. I just tried to find the most efficient resource for what I was doing. Okay, that's good to know. I know like- A lot of the schools, if you're going for fashion, obviously you have to apply. And then there's, I wouldn't say trust everything on YouTube because a lot of fashion, you have to know and do that research for materials, business portion of it, as well as working with like these vendor relationships, they're key. And learn your, learn your fabrics, know your fabrics. That's important. I think my fabric class paid off immensely. (laughs) No, no, you don't want anyone to have some allergies. Yeah. Not just allergies, but the strength of it. If I'm making leggings, you know, is it going to wick the moisture? Do I know, you know, knowing the fabric is important. And if you don't know this research, what's best to use for whatever it is you're making. That's a good point. So I'm going to move away because we talked a lot about business and just Mm -hmm. keep it a little light because we're coming up to time, like two minutes. Uh, (laughs) This is so much fun. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. So we're going to do finish the sentence. And this is where you add what you think of what pops in your head. Like my dream vacation is, what would that be? Greece, hopefully next year, 2022. Let's claim it. (laughs) I can live without coffee I don't drink it (laughs) my favorite food is salmon like pasta right now I don't know why I want pasta (laughs) salmon is big for me that's big on my list that's good I love salmon. uh my biggest inspiration is my daughter oh I can can see that I can see yeah And people describe me as intimidating. I don't know why. No, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to flip that script. I would describe Nicole as just such a warm, loving person Aww, with a thank full you. of creativity. And as soon as I met you, I think one of the things that drew me to you is just like, the fact that you respect creatives, like there's this artistic side of you. And I think that's how people should always know you as. You're not just the designer, you. you're the artist. Because you're Thank creating you. things for not only children's wear, but mommy's wear. And actually impacting so many beautiful lives through your brand. So oh, thank I want to <laughs> thank you again for joining me for the inspiration hour. And I feel inspired. I hope you feel oh. inspired. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now you're, you're, you're inspiring me with this podcast. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Yes. Queen. So I want to 
thank you. And I'm just going to close it saying with just lovingly that I wish you so many blessings. I know that this is not your only business. You're going to do much more than just Sumatu and Anne-Marie. I can feel the podcast coming in the air. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much. So thank and you. Congratulations again. to you with everything. Thank you. I needed that. <laughs> you have a good night, okay? You too. Take care. Bye. Bye. That brings us to the end of our inspiration hour with Luz. And I hope you're feeling unstoppable. If you enjoy our show, please follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Luz Mac Official or check out my website at www.luzmac.com. Review, like, and heart us. And don't forget to spread the inspiration with others. And be sure to come back next week as I help you find your inspiration in the little things, one talk at a time.